A truly terrible sickness has afflicted colleges and universities in this country, uh, which has reached horrifying levels over the course of the last month. And we have to ask, how is it that in the United States of America in the 21st century, have our supposedly most elite institutions been gripped by one of the most ancient retrograde prejudices that the world has ever known? How is it that universities that have systematically suppressed free speech for years, how have they suddenly discovered the First Amendment and invoked free speech as a reason not to condemn terrorism and anti-Semitism? How is it that institutions that have proliferated their diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies are turning a blind eye now to attacks on Jewish students on their own campuses? How is it that university administrations that have waded into every political issue of the day are now suddenly bound by institutional neutrality when it comes to the murder of children? Perhaps the intolerable irony and hypocrisy of it all is best illustrated by Harvard University, whose leadership remained silent and said nothing for days after October 7th. Meanwhile, 24 student groups filled the vacuum with a statement explaining that Israel itself was solely to blame for the attack. And it was only after enormous criticism from alumni like myself and Representative Elise Stefanik that Harvard President Colleen Gay came out with a very tepid statement, which still refused to condemn the student groups and instead said that Harvard is committed to free expression. The thing is, Harvard is not committed to free expression. There was a recent ranking of how committed 248 universities are to free expression, and Harvard was ranked dead last, number 248, the only institution to receive the abysmal rating. But I actually think that these things are not unrelated. And uh, Mr. Marcus, I think your testimony established that, that uh, the suppression of free speech and the rise of anti-Semitism actually in some ways go hand in hand. Uh, do you believe that the systematic suppression of free speech on college campuses has served to fuel the rise of anti-Semitism by silencing and excluding Jewish students on campus? Uh, yes, sir, Congressman. I think that there is a culture of intolerance in which certain viewpoints and certain identities are privileged and certain other ones are condemned. We no longer have on even our greatest college campuses a sense that we should have a reasoned debate among all or that every group should be treated with the same degree of equality. What we have is a kind of orthodoxy uh, which is taken over uh, from the faculty and also the student body. And this has implications not only for conservatives, but for other groups who are disdained within the institution, including uh, Jewish Americans. I'd like to uh, read a portion of a letter from the Legislative Jewish Caucus uh, in California uh, to show just how dire the situation is at the public universities in my own state. This is a letter addressed to the CSU, California State University, and the, leader, and the UC leaders. It says, among numerous other examples, we have heard from Jewish students at UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and San Jose State who report being physically attacked for expressing support for Israel. Jewish students at UC San Diego who required a police escort in order to safely leave a student meeting. Obscene anti-Israeli graffiti on a Jewish ritual space at Cal Poly Humboldt. Anti-Israel rallies at USCLA that interrupted classes with hate-filled rhetoric. A social media post by a UC Davis faculty member with knife, axe, and blood emojis calling for violence against Zionists in their homes and in their kids in school. And an increased need for, need for armed security at Jewish student centers on multiple campuses. Shockingly, the letter continues, anti-Israel student groups immediately celebrated the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th, while the UC Ethnic Studies Faculty Council glorified the largest mass murder, rape, and kidnapping of Jewish civilians since the Holocaust as worthy of support as part of the Palestinian freedom struggle. The letter goes on from these 18 legislators that Jewish students and faculty have shared with us disturbing examples of Jewish students being denied opportunities afforded to other student groups. Examples include administrators providing space on campus to various identity and affinity groups, but not to Jewish student organizations, and at least one Israeli student at UC Berkeley being told she could not participate in a class-related conference because of her nationality. Uh, given your experience at the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Education, do you believe there is more uh, that the department could be doing uh, about this sort of uh, uh, discrimination uh, and activity on campuses? 
Absolutely. Uh, there is more that the department can be doing, and it can do it tomorrow. Uh, the department has sent out links for Jewish students to file complaints. Uh, it has added language to its complaint forms. That's fine. But there is no reason why the department needs to wait for Jewish students to come to them. The department has the authority to initiate self-directed investigations anytime it opens the newspaper and sees that there is a problem at an institution that receives federal funds, and that's every single day if they're reading the papers. Moreover, Secretary of Education has the authority to commence nationwide compliance reviews in particular areas that are of concern. And again, there's no way that one can pay attention to higher education today and not realize that this is a serious national problem. These are things that can be done quickly, that don't require legislation, they don't require significant infusions of funds, they can be done with the current resources, and that can be done with the authority that the Secretary of Education already has.